an absurd question, but uh, what is statistics? So the, here it's a little bit, it's somewhere between math and science and technology. It's somewhere in that convex hole. So it's, uh, it's a set of principles that allow you to make inferences that have got some reason to be believed. And also principles that allow you to make decisions where you can have some reason to believe you're not going to make errors. Um, so all of that requires some assumptions about what do you mean by an error? What do you mean by, you know, the probabilities? And, um, but, you know, you start, after you start making some of those assumptions, you're led to uh, conclusions that, yes, I can guarantee that, you, you, you know, if you do this in this way, your probability of making an error will be small. Um, your probability of uh, continuing to not make errors over time will be small. I, and and uh, probability you found something that's real will be small, uh, will be high. So decision making is a big part. Decision making is a big part. Yeah. So uh, the original, so statistics, uh, you know, short history was that you know it sort of goes back, sort of as a formal discipline, you know, two hundred fifty years or so. Um, it was called inverse probability because around that era, uh, probability was developed, sort of especially to explain gambling um, situations. <laughs> of course. And um, interesting. So uh, you would say, well, given the state of nature is this, there's a certain roulette board that has a certain mechanism in it. Uh, what kind of outcomes do I expect to see? Uh, and um, especially if I do things long, long amounts of time, what outcomes will I see? And the physicists started to pay attention to this. Um, and then people say, well, given, uh, let's turn the problem around. What if I saw certain outcomes? Could I infer what the underlying mechanism was? That's an inverse problem. And in fact, for quite a while, statistics was called inverse probability. That was the name of the field. And I believe that uh, it was Laplace uh, who was working in Napoleon's government, who was trying, who needed to do a census of France, <laughs> learn about the people there. So he went and got and gathered data, and he analyzed that data to, 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 to determine policy, and uh, said, well, "Let's call this field uh, that does this kind of thing statistics, because um, the the word state is in there in French. That's état, but um, you know, it's the study of data for the state." Uh, um, so anyway, that caught on, and um, it's been called statistics ever since. But um, uh, but by the time it got formalized, it was sort of in the 30s. Um, and uh, around that time, there was game theory and decision theory developed nearby. Um, people in that era didn't think of themselves as either computer science or statistics or control or econ. They were all they were all of the above. And so you know, von Neumann is developing game theory, but also thinking of that as decision theory. Wald is an econometrician developing decision theory and then you know turning that into statistics. Uh, and so it's all about, here's, a, here's not just data and you analyze it, here's a, a loss function, here's what you care about, here's the question you're trying to ask. Uh, here is a probability model and here's the risk you will face if you make certain decisions. Um, and to, to this day, in most advanced statistical curricula, you teach decision theory as the starting point. And then it branches out into the two branches of Bayesian and frequentist, but um, that's it's all about decisions. In statistics, what is the most beautiful, mysterious, maybe surprising idea that you've come across? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of surprising ones. There's something that's way too technical for this thing, but something called James Stein estimation, which is kind of surprising and really takes time to wrap your head around. Can you try to maybe? Nah, I think I don't want even want to try. Um, <laughs> let me just say a colleague at, uh, at Steve, uh, Stephen Stigler at University of Chicago wrote a really beautiful paper on James Stein estimation, which is, helps to, it's viewed as a paradox. It kind of defeats the mind's attempts to understand it, but you, you can, and Steve has a nice perspective on that. Um, there, uh, so one of the troubles with statistics is that it's like in physics that are in quantum physics, you have multiple interpretations. There's a wave and particle duality in physics and you get used to that over time, but it still kind of haunts you that you don't really, you know, quite understand the relationship. The electron's a wave and electron's a particle. Well, mm. um, well, the same thing happens here. There's Bayesian ways of thinking and frequentist and they are different. They, they, all, they sometimes become sort of the same in practice but they are philosophically different. And then in some practice, they are not the same at all. They give you rather different answers. Um, and so it is very much like wave and particle duality. And that is something you have to kind of get used to in the field. Can you define Bayesian and frequentist? As yeah, in decision theory, you can make, I have a like I have a video that people could see. It's called, are you a Bayesian or a frequentist? And kind of help try to, 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 uh, to make it really clear. It comes from decision theory. So, uh, you know, decision theory, uh, you're talking about loss functions, which are a function of, data x and parameter theta for a function of two arguments okay neither one of those arguments is known you don't know the data a priori it's random 
and the parameter is unknown. All right. So you have this function of two things you don't know, and you're trying to say, I want that function to be small. I want small loss. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, what are you going to do? So you sort of say, well, I'm going to average over these quantities or maximize over them or something so that, you know, uh, I turn that uncertainty into something certain. Um, so you could look at the first argument and average over it, or you could look at the second argument and average over it. That's Bayesian frequentist. So the, the frequentist says, I'm going to look at the X, the data, and I'm going to take that as random, and I'm going to average over the distribution. So I take the expectation of loss under X. Theta is held fixed, mm -hmm. right? That's called the risk. And so it's looking at mm -hmm. other all the data sets you could get, right? And saying, how well will a certain procedure do under all those data sets? That's called a frequentist guarantee, right? So I think of this very appropriate when like you're building a piece of software and you're shipping it out there and people are going to use it on all kinds of data sets. You want to have a stamp, a guarantee on it that as people run it on many, many data sets that you never even thought about, that 95% of the time it will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, perfectly reasonable. Uh, the Bayesian perspective says, well, no, I'm going to look at the other argument of the loss function, the theta part. Okay, that's unknown and I'm uncertain about it. So I could have my own personal probability for what it is. You know, how many tall people are there out there? I'm trying to infer the average height of the population. Well, I have an idea roughly what the, the height is. So I'm going to average over the, um, the, the theta. So now that loss function has only now, again, one argument's gone. Now it's a function of X. And that's what a Bayesian does is they say, well, let's just focus on the particular X we got, the data set we got. We condition on that. Conditional on the X, I say something about my loss. That's a Bayesian approach to things. And the Bayesian uh, will argue that it's not relevant to look at all the other data sets you could have gotten and average over them, the frequentist approach. It's really only the data set you got, all right? And I do agree with that, especially in situations where you're working with a scientist, you can learn a lot about the domain and you're really only focused on certain kinds of data and you gather your data and you make inferences. Um, I don't agree with it, though, that, it, you know, in the sense that there are needs for frequentist guarantees. You're writing software, people are using it out there, you want to say something. So these two things have to got to fight each other a little bit, but they have to blend. So long story short, there's a set of ideas that are right in the middle that are called empirical bays. And empirical bays sort of starts with the Bayesian framework. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of arguably philosophically more, you know, reasonable and kosher write down a bunch of the math that kind of flows from that and then realize there's a bunch of things you don't know because it's the real world and you don't know everything. So you're uncertain about certain quantities. At that point, ask, is there a reasonable way to plug in an estimate for those things? Okay. And in some cases, there's quite a reasonable thing to do um, to plug in. There's a natural thing you can observe in the world that you can plug in and then do a little bit more mathematics and assure yourself it's really good. So based so my on math or based on human expertise, what's what are, what are good? They're, they're both going in. The Bayesian framework allows you to put a lot of human expertise in, yeah. um, but the math kind of guides you along that path and then kind of reassures you at the end you could put that stamp of approval. Under certain assumptions, this thing will work. So Pratt, you asked the question, what's my favorite, you know, or what's yes. the most surprising nice idea? So one that is more accessible is something called false discovery rate, which is... Um, you know, you, you're uh, making not just one hypothesis test or making one decision, you're making a whole bag of them. And in that bag of decisions, you look at the ones where you made a discovery. You announced that something interesting had happened. All right, that's gonna be some subset of your big bag. Mm -hmm. In the ones you made a discovery, which subset of those are bad? There are false, false discoveries. You'd like the fraction of your false discoveries among your discoveries to be small. Mm -hmm. That's a different criterion than accuracy or precision or recall or sensitivity and specificity. It's, it's a different quantity. Those latter ones are almost all of them um, um, have more of a frequentist flavor. They say, given the truth is that the null hypothesis is true, here's what accuracy I would get. Or given that the alternative is true, here's what I would get. So it's kind of going forward from the state of nature mm -hmm. to the data. The Bayesian goes the other direction from the data back to the state of nature. And that's actually what false discovery rate is. It says, given you made a discovery, okay, that's conditioned on your data, mm -hmm. what's the probability of the hypothesis? Mm -hmm. It's going the other direction. Uh, and so um, the classical frequency look at that, say, so, well, I can't know that there's some priors needed in that. And the empirical Bayesian goes ahead and pl plows forward and starts writing down these formulas and realizes at some point, some of those things can actually be estimated in a reasonable way. Oh, wow. And so it's kind of, it's a beautiful set of ideas. So I, I the, this kind of line of argument has come out, it's not certainly mine, but it, it, it sort of came out from Robbins around 1960, 
Uh, Brad Efron has, has uh, written beautifully about this in various papers and books. And uh, and the FDR is, you know, Benyamini uh, in, in Israel. Um, John Story did this Bayesian interpretation and so on. So I've just uh, absorbed these things over the years and find it a very healthy way to think about statistics.